welcome back to those of you who attended our funded section just prior on uh, with Pharmac with Logan Hayes. Uh, now we'll be looking at what are those options for accessing medicine in various ways uh, in a more unfunded situation. Um, so I'm very pleased to have Dr. Richard Ducey uh, here with me today, and he has very nicely been able to work his way into our virtual world in order to keep this going today. So let me just give you a little bit of background on Richard. Uh, it's quite a lot of information because he's been doing a lot of excellent things, so bear with me. Uh, Richard is a clinical hematologist with a specialist interest in malignant hematology, including lymphoma, myeloma, leukemia, and hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. He completed a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery at Otago University and the Christchurch School of Medicine before completing his internal medicine and postgraduate hematology training in the Auckland region. He became a fellow of the Australasian Colleges of Physicians and Pathologists in 2003 and undertook two years of subspecialty training in acute leukemia, high-grade lymphoma and bone marrow transplantation at Vancouver General Hospital and the British Columbia Cancer Agency. Richard returned to Auckland in 2005 as a consultant hematologist and is currently the director of Auckland and Starship Children's Hospitals Stem Cells Transplant Program. So welcome, Richard. And the topic of today's talk is what are all of my options? Navigating access to unfunded blood cancer treatments in the New Zealand environment. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to talk and the uh, int introduction. I'll just share the screen and then we'll get going. Um, Okay, so hopefully you can see all that. That's fantastic. So um, yes, I, um, I was asked perhaps to give a perspective on the uh, other options of uh, accessing uh, treatments for the for blood cancers in the New Zealand environment, perhaps outside the, the more commonly and what is really the main way we, we look to treat patients in New Zealand in the DHB and Pharmac funded world. I appreciate that I potentially will be coming with this from a, a physician, a doctor, medical professional uh, perspective. And there will be things that I have not uh, focused on um, from a patient and their whanau perspective, and I'm more than happy to sort of take uh, questions and comments around that, uh, but we'll see how we go. I want to make sure we leave lo lots of opportunity for those who'd like to ask any questions, no matter what they are. So as um, often when we have medical talks, we have to declare our disclosures and conflicts of interest. So I'm proud to say that I'm a haematologist at Auckland Hospital in the Regional Cancer and Blood Service. And uh, the pictures below uh, are, of Mot are of Mototapu Ward. It's now seven years old, but still looks like it was built yesterday. And it's really the jewel and the crown of the service that um, we provide up at Auckland Hospital. Um, and it, it, it really is a, an amazing place to work. I have no trouble getting out of bed in the morning and, and turning up there. Um, I'm also a haematologist at Canopy Cancer Care, which is a private cancer provider that's now across a variety of sites, as, as mentioned there. Um, so we sort of have a different perspective at times on, on uh, how we deliver the, the blood cancer treatments in New Zealand. Um, I just want to have a huge shout out to uh, my team uh, at Auckland Hospital and actually to all the you know, haematology units across New Zealand, because We've really uh, been hit with a bit of a double whammy. COVID has uh, really hit us in the way that we have to practice our medicine uh, with dividing the teams into what we call clean and dirty to protect our staff and protect the patients from any potential cross infections. So it has made treatments very challenging. I'm sure for the patients out there listening, they'll appreciate this. Um, the other side of things too, in our world specifically, and again, there may be patients listening who are, who are intimately involved with this, is that we're sort of victims of our own success and on the right is a graph uh, showing the annual stem cell transplant activity in New Zealand, uh, sorry, at Auckland over the last 11 years, which sort of replicates overseas activity. But, you know, we, have, we were doing close to 40 transplants at the start of that graph. Now we're on target to do 140 this year. So there's lots of capacity demand issues that we're trying to navigate and make sure that we continue to provide this treatment. But I just really want to put a huge shout out to uh, particularly our nursing team, uh, our pharmacists, healthcare assistants, orderlies, security works, cleaners, anyone's involved um, continuing to provide pretty amazing care and what's a, a pretty pressured environment and just reflects the, um, the healthcare system. Um, so... 
Also want to do a big shout out to my father, Tom, who's in the top right there. Um, it, it's 20 degrees in Christchurch. I'm a Christchurch lad, and I was looking forward to being in Christchurch this weekend and sitting down tomorrow and watching the Warriors and then the All Blacks. What a, what a dream Father's Day that was going to be. So uh, won't get there this time, but uh, maybe Christmas Day. So um, with a blood cancer, um, a patient will be diagnosed. Uh, it's an overwhelming diagnosis, incredible amount of questions going through your mind and trying to navigate the system. You know, I've been told I've got a black blood cancer, now what? On the left, we're, we're wanting smooth sailing. We, we want to sort of navigate the calm waters and get a fantastic outcome. But of course, there's the other side of things. Uh, where potentially patients and their families uh, understandably are left confused, unsure, lost, unclear, perplexed. And we appreciate, as the health team, professional team looking after you, we appreciate that. Um, and, and it can be a very distressing time. So I thought I'd sort of approach this from a few different perspectives. Um, so New Zealand has this unique health system uh, for a country of five and a half million, you know, the size of a big city overseas. We have these 20 district health boards and of course things potentially are about to change. What that all means is very uncertain. But we have the concept of primary care in your GP practice, uh, secondary care, um, where your local DHB of domicile will provide your lymphoma, your myeloma, your chronic leukemia type treatment, just to name a few. And then you may need to be referred to a tertiary center that provides the more intensive treatment, acute leukemia, high-grade lymphoma, stem cell transplant. There is also this, uh, this term quaternary, which for example, if we have a stem cell transplant patient, we might need to refer to a specialized liver unit within Auckland Hospital. So that's what that refers to. But as you can see, the geography and the district health boards means that this um, does you know, raise issues of equity of access from a geographical perspective, uh, to name just one point. Um, but there is the ability for tertiary referral. Um, and of course, clinical trials may be open at one centre and not another. And we as um, the haematology community are quite keen to cross refer patients to other district health boards to get access to novel drugs. But sometimes that can be sort of difficult and let down by the sort of management view of that and the ability to support people away from home. So as I said, how this may all change with the new um, health reforms is, um, remains to be determined. So uh, another question we, we get asked is which doctor? Um, so uh, in the New Zealand health system, the haematology units at the, uh, the various hospitals work as a team. We're a nosy bunch of people. We uh, work together and, and look after the, you as the patients as a whole, but you do get a primary specialist um, at most centres where that person gets to know you and your family and, and your treatment pathway because, as you know, a lot of this haematology stuff is pretty complex and you need to have that one point of reference, excuse me, that can be sort of running your care and, and looking after you. But what that does mean is that when you sort of get referred into the public hospital system, you can't specify the doctor that you would like to see. From our perspective, we think that is fine because as I said, we work as a team and it will depend sort of on who's on take is the term. So who's looking after the day stay or the inpatient service, the outpatient service, who are you gonna be referred to? And we could potentially talk about that a bit later on as well. Cancer can be treated in different ways. So surgery, radiation, good old chemotherapy, immunotherapy, hormone therapy, targeted therapy, and stem cell treatment. And I put down the, the bottom there also the concepts of complementary and alternative therapy. And we heard a great talk from Rob Wineco this morning, sort of outlining the future ahead with some of these, what we call novel or new treatments. So how your blood cancer is going to be managed really depends on a multitude of factors such as the type of blood cancer and the extent of it and who you are as a patient and your other health issues and what treatments are available, both in a funded DHB or non-funded setting. Um, surgery is not really a typical treatment for blood cancers. 
um, but definitely chemotherapy, immunotherapy are the two mainstays. Radiation may have a role in certain situations. And of course, as I said, the newer treatments are coming. So we've just heard from Logan um, in the previous talk about the uh, funding of uh, mechanisms for um, uh, cancer patients in New Zealand. For those of you who weren't at that talk, just briefly, uh, money comes from your tax payments, goes into central government, the Ministry of Health, who then determine what is their priority for funding down to the district health boards, who then decide how they are going to fund their pot of money for their local population. So Vote Health has about a $24 billion budget for 2021. 2022, of which just over a billion is the Pharmac budget from where the cancer drugs will be allotted out of. So I'm not going to go into great detail because Logan's already given you a rundown on how this process works, but just to emphasize that there are some important steps that any cancer treatment has to be MedSafe approved, meaning it's been uh, shown to be uh, safe um, and has been registered. Um, this does not mean that it's funded, but it's been, it's, it's been considered as, a, as an appropriate medication to be prescribed in New Zealand. You can have drugs administered that are outside MedSafe approval, and these are used under a, a term called Section 29. Uh, then there is the Pharmac funding, the DHB implementation, but very importantly, for the uh, teams in the public hospital systems and the DHB, we can only give Pharmac funded treatments. And on the right is uh, a, a graph or a, a diagram that Logan showed you about the, the funding of the, uh, the journey of a funding application from the start uh, right through to when the, the drug is listed. Uh, lots of factors go into how that drug is um, uh, assessed and then ultimately funded. But as has been referenced a few times today, and no doubt you're all aware that uh, cancer costs are uh, rising all the time, and the, the drugs and the treatments. And this is a, a paper that was published uh, from the American Society of Oncology in their educational book this year. Um, and I think the, the title says it all, an arm and a leg, the rising cost of cancer drugs and impact on access. But I was interested to know when, note when I was reading through this, just in the first, one of the first sort of paragraphs, they talk about the main impacts for high cancer drug prices are the lack of access for patients and the lack of ensuing benefits of what we call the newer treatments and novel therapies, which they think is widely true for what's called low and middle income countries. But it was very interesting to note that they pointed out in jurisdictions with managed care and major budgetary restraints, and they, uh, they identified New Zealand particularly. And the downstream consequence there is chemotherapy, old-fashioned chemo, that again Rob Weincove talked about this morning, which has been the mainstay of a, and still is of a lot of our treatments, is more affordable and way, widely accessible, but it's often... Um, used because um, target therapies and immunotherapies can't, we can't access, but they are more effective and less toxic. And potentially this results in inferior outcomes and greater toxicity. Um, and also potentially that's relevant in lower and middle income countries because they can't get the additional support of care to manage the side effects. So there's this double-edged sword of actually the many of the patients who would benefit most from these innovations and new treatments and precision oncology are also the, the countries and the patients who are most least likely to afford them. So, you know, it's a recognized problem. I don't have the answer. Pharmax doing their best. And, I mean, another part of the picture is the pharmaceutical companies. And this is a very sobering diagram, which I'll take you through. So on the left here, you have billions of dollars and the time since the product launch. And looking at individual drugs and how much cumulative sales have, have occurred. And if we sort of look at drugs that we're familiar with in the hematology world, rituximab, $93 billion of sales. Um, lenalidomide, $47 billion. Ibrutinib early on in its time course, $9 billion. 
So there is obviously an opportunity for everyone involved in cancer drug access to play a, play a part in the, of getting um, uh, wider access, uh, the, the, the drug companies and their, and their prices, the regulatory bodies and how they fund the drugs, but importantly also the clinicians and the patients, how they advocate for these therapies. This is data going back 10 years almost, but we know, we feel we're pretty special in haematology. Um, and one of the reasons we're special is that we're good at spending money. And so in the European economy, the total cost of blood disorders when this in 2012 was published was $23 billion, of which half of it was cancer and half of it was non-cancer blood disease. And when you break down cancer in total, lung cancer, 21 billion, breast cancer, 17 billion, but blood cancers do make up, even though they're far less common than these solid tumors, they still make up a huge amount of the drug and health expenditure budget. Uh, and a lot of that does relate to the inpatient care needed to look after some of our treatments, such as acute leukemia and stem cell transplant. So with that sort of background, um, I'm jumping ahead a bit and we're going to come back to it, but we've talked about the fact that in the DHB public setting, we, we prescribe pharmac funded therapies. We know that potentially out there are blood cancer treatments that can be very effective, uh, can provide huge benefit to the patient, and but they're not they're, they're difficult to obtain. Now, it may be because they are currently going through a pharmac funding process, or it may be that they have been declined for efficacy or effectiveness or, or cost situations, or it may be it's just because something has been developed uh, in an overseas health system, particularly the US, which is where a lot of our therapies are, are, are developed and approved, but it just takes time to filter down to good old New Zealand. So, what are the options of a patient is looking to access non pharmac funded treatments in our environment? So within the district health board, there are still opportunities to get non pharmac funded therapies that could be on clinical trials. Pharmac does have a um, exceptional circumstances scheme. So that is where a patient may be, may thought to be potentially could benefit from a, a, a non pharmac funded treatment and their clinician will put in a um, application to Pharmac citing some exceptional circumstances around why they think that patient would benefit from that treatment and can it please be funded. There are also pharmaceutical company access programs and these have different terminologies, uh, compassionate, which I always say in inverted commas, um, where the drug may be provided free of charge and also a co-pay system where the uh, patient may pay, have a part payment on some of the drugs. Now, it does depend if they are delivered by oral means or the require intravenous and subcutaneous. And also in most public hospitals, they still have to undergo a, a, a process of rigor where the pharmacy, the clinical team and the hospital approve the use of that access program because it's felt to be sort of ethically appropriate to, to be uh, having that program on site. A private cancer clinic um, can be used to access non pharmac funded treatment. This may be under health insurance, but it does depend on the policy type and what sort of cancer treatment cover is within that particular health insurance. And we, I'll talk about that a bit later on. And again, the private cancer clinic could also offer the access programs. And there, there will be patients who wish to self-fund their cancer treatment in a uh, private cancer clinic. COVID has made this less appealing and quite challenging, but there will be patients that travel to overseas cancer clinics because they feel that there is a therapy available at one of these clinics that uh, they wish to pursue.
So where are the New Zealand private cancer clinics? As I said at the start, I, I work with Canopy Cancer Care, who uh, has um, uh, treatment centres in Whangarei, Auckland, Tauranga and Hawke's Bay. Within the Auckland uh, area, there is also Harbour Cancer Centre in Auckland Oncology, um, Braemar Hospital in Hamilton, Bowen Icon in Wellington, St George's in Christchurch and Mercy in Dunedin. I apologise to any private providers out there that I've missed off, but these are the ones that are, I'm familiar with. So why do we need a private cancer clinic? I suppose the history of New Zealand has been that we um, uh, uh, are well served by a public uh, healthcare system. We're incredibly proud of our healthcare uh, system in New Zealand and the public setting. And the vast majority of patients get incredible service. They get incredible treatment. They're looked after by incredible people and they get fantastic outcomes. Can, uh, private uh, medicine in New Zealand has sort of arisen out of surgical waiting lists. So if you need your eye sur cataract surgery, you need your hip replacement, you need your cardiac workup, rather than sitting on a wait list in the public system, you can um, access that through uh, private care. So with respect to cancer and blood cancer, obviously you can access non-pharmac DHB funded treatments. You potentially will be seen earlier for assessment, investigations and treatment. I'm not saying that that means you're gonna get a better cancer outcome, but of course, once someone knows that their diet or that they're in the workup of a blood cancer diagnosis, getting to see someone who's gonna tell them all the information they need to know and get all the um, test done and get on to treatment sooner rather than later isn't very important for some people, but I'm not um, implying that the, uh, you'll get an inferior outcome for your cancer care in the, in the public system. Because of that comment I said before that you can't specify usually the doctor that you're going to see in the public system, then patients will request to see a specific haematologist, oncologist, blood cancer doctor by accessing a private cancer clinic. I suppose having worked across both sites, um, I wouldn't see that a private clinic is necessarily as busy or chaotic as a DHB cancer center. Um, and it usually is a, a more dedicated time for consultation and, sp and spending. It's one of the things I enjoy about the private part of my job is to, to sit down and have a very um, thorough consultation with the patient rather than sort of potentially getting interrupted all the time um, as, it, as it's busy at the DHB. And I know a lot of my colleagues uh, appreciate that part of their private role as well. Uh, in the private setting, we tend to have predominantly just specialist senior doctors and nurses. So we don't have a situation where the way the public system has to run by the sheer volume of patients and the training needs for junior doctors and nurses that potentially you can see different faces and of differing skill sets at different times. But that's just the way the place runs and which is in a positive as well for the DHB. Uh, if you have health insurance that can pay for the consults, the investigations, the drugs and the treatment costs. And another um, service that can be run out of private cancer clinics is a second opinion where a patient and their family want to just have some other opinions about their diagnosis and what the treatment might hold. But there are some caveats about private cancer clinics. I think it's important to acknowledge that they are outpatient based, so there's no inpatient care. And as a lot of you will know, and even have gone through, when we give our treatments for blood cancers, we potentially turn off the bone marrow factory, lower the bone marrow counts, and you need blood transfusions. Um, you need to have hospital admission for infections, and that can't be provided through the outpatient clinic uh, of a private cancer care usually. So there needs to be some careful liaison and shared care arrangement with the local DHB. It's a terrible situation, but there's a, the, the um, accessibility of private clinical records and public or vice versa is, is, um, isn't far from ideal. And so patients can be end up in the public system with a complication with people scratching their heads and trying to find clinical records that relate to their 
um, their private care, and that's not just cancer, but that's right across all sorts of private care. Um, it's important to get multidisciplinary meetings for a review of the case and peer review of the uh, tests and treatment plan. And potentially that could be limited in a private setting as opposed to the sort of more wraparound care of a, of a public DHB hematology unit. And then, you know, you might be quoted all the costs of your cancer care in a private clinic, but really are all the costs involved, particularly if there are lots of complications. So a few sort of bullet points about private cancer clinics. Uh, there are significant costs involved. Um, it's an uncomfortable part of the discussion, but they are businesses. And um, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be supported with the buildings and the treatment costs and the staff wages. So, um, you know, there's a, and it's a very uncomfortable discussion at times um, for clinicians that have worked predominantly in the public system to say, well, you know, here's a business and it's, it's, it's people uh, profiting out of healthcare. Um, importantly, the drug costs uh, are passed on with no markup. So it, it's, the, it's the other costs that contribute to the additional um, monies that are needed to be treated in, in, in private. And this is patient choice. And I, I probably should have said that right from the word go. This is the way that, um, that I, I sort of consider private cancer therapy. This is about patient choice. Now, some of you may be aware of this recent development in um, the um, sort of world of private cancer care. So uh, in, in politics, there is something called members bills, which is simply, I understand, a biscuit tin, tin where um, politicians come up with new bills that they wish to push through parliament and you sort of randomly get chosen from the ballot. So Shane Retty, who is the National Party health spokesperson, who's uh, from Northland, he has um, come up with a member's bill that basically um, talks about the fact that the cost of administering or the treatment fees of an unfunded cancer medicine can sometimes be as much as the medicine itself. And transport to a private facility, he might drive straight past a closer, capable public hospital. So these are fair um, and, uh, observations, true observations. So he's come uh, developing this bill where basically he th thinks that um, patients who pay for their unfunded cancer medicine could then bring that to the public system to have the treatment. This is something that is uh, prevented around with the current sort of crown funding arrangements. And um, this goal, this bill is basically to say to prohibit district health boards making their facilities available to patients who require administration of cancer medicines that are not funded by Pharmac. So Andrew Little, the um, health minister has um, responded to this. Um, and uh, he's not in favour because he says that this would potentially mean have a two-tier system that, that uh, patients who could afford their drugs would then take up space and valuable resource in the public health system by then having their privately funded treatments uh, given in the public sector. And so it would create further inequity. So given the Labour majority in the current parliament, it's unlikely that this bill would um, go further. I think another part of this too is that um, one of the reasons that a drug might not be funded by Pharmac because Pharmac has done its careful review and felt that the effectiveness or the, um, you know, the additional benefit by this so-called expensive drug might be quite minimal. So I'm not sure how this bill would potentially sort of prioritise or um, triage any cancer drug to say, yes, this is a good idea that you We'll pay, we'll let you have it in public, or actually you're going to get some minimal benefit from this. What's the evidence it's going to work? And so therefore we're not going to give it to you in public. So I haven't seen any details around that concept. So we look at sort of examples of non-funded drugs with disease indications. Um, and I've put there, um, I think it was Rob again this morning talking about clinical trials and how they uh, develop in New Zealand or overseas. 
So you have phase one and two, which are around safety and looking at effectiveness. And then the sort of pivotal phase three trials where you take a new treatment and you compare it to the standard of care and see if it really does show additional benefit. So I think there's some, well, some, there's lots of drugs that in the haematology cancer world that we would see as beneficial that uh, either in the process of being Pharmac funded uh, are yet to be uh, put in front of Pharmac for funding or potentially have already been assessed and declined. So if I just go through a few of these, acute myeloid leukemia, azacitidine, venetoclax, AML is becoming a, a, a very um, uh, disease that's shown to have lots of subtypes, lots of molecular subtypes, and potentially these will be druggable, meaning, or well, they are, that specific inhibitor drugs can target certain types. Antibody therapy for ALL, lintumab, inotuzumab, CAR T cell therapy, a very ex exciting treatment, but very expensive. And that, that's, a, that's a discussion for another day about how we get CAR T cell therapy into New Zealand. Venetoclax for MDS. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge gap in New Zealand's um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia treatment basket with the BTK inhibitors, ibrutinib, but the newer generation drugs coming. Henry Chan this morning mentioned upfront lenalidomide, but also the antibody treatments, daratumumab, proteasome inhibitor carfilzomib, the imid pomalidomide, and again, CAR T cell therapies. And I think myeloma patients uh, are sort of lagging behind now, uh, for example, Australia with the drug access. And I know that uh, the myeloma support group in New Zealand is doing a huge amount of work behind the scenes advocating for myeloma patients uh, and drug access. Uh, other drugs, fetoratinib, which is a, a new JAK inhibitor for in mitoproliftor disorders, uh, abinutuzumab for follicular lymphoma, polituzumab for large cell lymphoma, brentuximab for T-cell lymphomas and Hodgkin lymphoma, pembrolizumab as well for Hodgkin's, and uh, for a rare blood disease called paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, the standard of care drug complement inhibitor, ecoluzumab is not available in New Zealand. So just off the top of my head, I could sort of think of quite a few medications that potentially would benefit um, blood cancer patients in New Zealand. So if we think about an approach for, for the patient and their family with this new blood cancer diagnosis, and these are some thoughts that, that came to mind. Um, the health professionals that you'll see at the public system, they're on, you know, we're on your side. We want the best outcome for you and your whanau. We want to try and explain the best of things to our ability. You need to find out who's your primary specialist. You, lots of people want to give you good information, but sometimes they'll say it differently. Sometimes it will confuse the hell out of you. You've got to get that one person who's going to give you that consistency of answer. Yes, the DHB is a busy place. And yes, there will be waiting times for the, your tests and the start of treatment. And I put waiting times in, in inverted commas because there's a wait time because the place is busy. There's lots of people needing the test. But it doesn't mean that there's going to be an adverse event. This doesn't mean that your cancer won't be, have the best successful outcome. It's just going to take some time to go through the process. And it's interesting to see that the faster cancer treatment times uh, that was sort of initially developed and then went away. And more recently, the new health indicators that have been developed don't include these um, waiting times that we're keeping cancer centers to task a bit about when you should be seen, uh, when your test should be done by, and how quickly you should start treatment. Yes, we are influenced by what Pharmac is funded. We only can do what we're, only can give you what we're allowed to give you. Your team should be receptive of your own research about your cancer and treatments. There's no such thing as a silly or a stupid question. We have the privilege of, of being educated in this medicine and having our own clinical experience, but it's all new for you. Um, we should be receptive to a request for a second opinion. I often say that you, your roof needs fixing. You don't take the first bloke who turns up in the, in the dodgy uh, van. You get three good quotes on to fix your roof and, and you choose the best one, not necessarily based on cost. But um, so there's nothing wrong with a second opinion if you, if you want some clarity about things. 
a health professional in the public system should not mind about being asked about best or non-funded treatments. But it is a difficult discussion because we're so um, used to what we can provide and the treatment that you're getting in, in the public system may well be, and a lot of times it is, the standard of care, the best treatment available. Um, but how, how is that told to you? How, how do you uh, broach that question um, with, your, uh, with your doctor? And it can be, it, it depends on a few things. You know, it, it, it's difficult to give a, a non-funded therapy outside the public system if you have a diagnosis of acute leukemia and you're stuck in a hospital ward. Uh, that's really not going to be, you can't travel up to the, the private clinic. It depends on, you know, are you newly diagnosed or is this a relapse of your disease? Um, depends on who you are. Do you have um, any other health issues that would mean that that treatment's not a good one for you for you because of your heart or your lungs or your kidneys? And also this concept of sequencing. So sometimes there are um, some treatments that potentially could be used earlier on in the disease, but that might mean that a patient has to spend a lot of money and potentially the, the, the standard of care treatment might actually work very well and therefore you don't need to spend that extra money or potentially that extra money can be kept in reserve should things not go well. So it also depends on what stage you're at, what other treatments you've had and what, how you might sequence any funded or non-funded therapies. I think it's also important to recognise that the Health and Disability Commission does have a code of health and disability services and consumer rights. And number six is a right to be fully informed. And I've just highlighted there that, you know, a consumer, a patient, has a full right to an explanation of the options available, including an assessment of the expected risks, side effects, benefits, and costs of each, of each option. But again, that is open to interpretation because what are the options available? Uh, you've got the, 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 the team in front of you in the DHB setting explaining the options available there. What is the obligation for them to talk about any non-funded or private options? Some, some will spontaneously, but the, I suspect the vast majority of situations it will have to become from a targeted question from the patient or their family. So with regards to your disease, looking at the time here, um, you want to understand your diagnosis. And what does it actually mean? Yes, you've been told you've got diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, but you know, what does that actually mean? Can I, can I have that explanation, please, in a, in a sense of what that disease is? What stage it is? What is the status? We talk about prognostic factors in haematology. Um, you know, do, I, do I have a bad version of that disease or a standard version of that disease? Um, this, the world of haematology, as, as Rob and Myra talked about this morning, is, is, is rapidly advancing with our understanding of the molecular genetics of the makeup of the diseases, which can help us classify the disease, what the exact subtype it is, how, how well it might uh, behave with uh, treatment, and are there any options for targeting um, that, that disease with a drug? And on the right here is this, this example of acute myeloid leukemia and on the outside, all the different genetic mutations that we're about to, that we're learning about, and they often don't happen in isolation, but in combinations, which only adds to the complexity. Um, and then what is the natural history of this disease? Uh, what, what's, it, what's it going to do? Is it a fast growing, a slow growing? Are you trying to cure it or what? Who am I as a patient? My age, my other health issues, my access to healthcare, my support network, my travel support. Um, at Auckland Hospital, we often look after our, um, our patients in Fano from Whangarei and uh, they need to come down and, and, and stay at Domain Lodge or some local accommodation for you know, weeks on end because it's too unsafe for them to go back to hospital. They're not having, they've had their cancer over treatment over a couple of days, but they need to hang around to make sure they don't get infections and get admitted to hospital. It's a huge stress on, on, the, on the patient and their Fano. So you need to ask about what are the goals of the treatment, curative versus non-curative, do my age, how the health issues, uh, where I live, my support network affect things. What's the, what's the, what are you going to give me? What, to, what are the names and the type of drugs? Are they intravenous, subcutaneous or through the mouth? How many cycles? How long is it all going to take? 
what are the common side effects or the less common. Chances of it working is a challenging one. It can be quoted in so many ways, subjectively, why it's got a good chance of working or not the best chance of working. There's statistics we can quote, but statistics are incredibly um, difficult at times because it's not telling you what's going to happen to you. If someone's got an 80% chance of, of the cancer being brought under control, we, we don't know if you're in the 80 or the 20, but it gives you a flavor of what we're, what we're expecting. How do you know if the treatment's working? How are you going to assess that? Is that CT scans, PET scans, bone marrow tests? Remission just means where a cancer comes under control. So the top, remission means different things for different cancers and even within the same cancer, depending on the type of treatment you've had. So just be careful with the word remission. What, what, what actually are they, uh, has been trying to be explained to you? And of course, the big one and, and the, the words life expectancy, the, the words death and dying are very difficult to, to broach with the team. But important, you know, if you have a blood cancer diagnosis, it's very important to understand for you and, and your family and, and your life road, you know, will this expect, affect my life expectancy? And importantly too, I think, has my case been discussed in what's called a multidisciplinary meeting or a peer review environment where we look at the, all the tests and, and the biopsies and the PET scans and the CTs, whatever's involved in, in, in a group of in, in a clinicians uh, just consider the best treatment pathway. So if you are going through this process, um, again, uh, in the public sector, um, then also you want to be asking as things we've covered off before, clinical trials, non-pharmac funded treatments, is there an exceptional circumstances option for my situation, compassionate co-pay programs, self-funded health insurance and second opinions. Just quickly, um, Working in a private cancer clinic, we have no connection or link to health insurance companies. Um, we provide quotes for an individual's health insurance company to determine a, or policy if they will pay for it. So should someone get health insurance, that's a patient choice uh, consideration. Again, which company? Have a shop around if you're interested. There's lots out there. Importantly, what does the policy cover? I was very surprised when I first did, started doing private medicine to understand how some of these policies are worded around the fact that the policy might only cover pharmac funded drugs, which sort of given the huge advocacy and the amazing service in the public system didn't quite make sense to me why you would then play a policy that only didn't fund the drugs that you wanted to see outside the hospital system. Um, and they, they're variable, the cover is incredibly variable across the different policies companies. Um, premiums get getting bigger as you get older and uh, our blood cancers do affect uh, us, as, uh, us as individuals as we get into an older age group. And, you know, should I keep paying my premiums is often a very, uh, is often a question that's often asked. How do you get to see a private cancer clinic? It can be initi initiated by your DHB specialist or your GP. I think it's important to note that if your DHB specialist is also a private provider, then really it's not appropriate that that DHB specialist self-refers to their private cancer clinic. I think that's best coming from the GP, and you need to understand that there are potentially other private providers available that might you might want to seek advice from. It's difficult just to give seat of the pants um, sort of random quotes. Um, I know people want to know how much the treatment's going to cost, but really you need to go and have an initial consultation to get for the, patient, the doctor to understand more about you and who you are, but also to give you more detailed information about the treatment goals, the logistics, the side effects, et cetera. And those cost quotes should detail the drug costs, the treatment costs, the supervision costs, and any additional costs such as scans and et cetera. Um, understandably, patients who may have failed public funded treatment and are, are, are very concerned that their cancer is progressing and there's no treatment options left, we'll go looking for other therapies. And so it, re it really needs to be carefully assessed about the potential effectiveness of any treatment uh, because it shouldn't be just that you can buy a treatment that it should be given. 
there needs to be some rationale that the treatment has been carefully explained and reviewed and is thought to be in the patient's best interests. And it's important to understand how and where any side effects or complication will be managed. This concept of a, a shared care arrangement with the local DHB hematology unit. So that's the um, end of sort of the thoughts that came to me when I sort of um, was asked to do this presentation and give it the title that I did. Um, uh, Peter Ferguson and Emma, um, I said, well, do you know of questions that people might want to ask? So I got sent this sort of list, which I can go through if that's helpful. Why don't I go through it? And then I see this in Q&A. Um, so how much is a general consultation? I can't speak for other private providers, but where I work, Canopy, it's approximately $450 for the first consultation set, set by the organization. Um, if I have, um, just move this out of the way. If I have um, private health insurance or willing to self-fund, should I see a specialist in New Zealand if they've got a special interest for my disease or, the, or just the local specialist? I think, I think in that setting, you really potentially want to find someone who you want, you want some answers about your disease. Um, it really depends. It might be a more common blood cancer that uh, a hematologist in your local area uh, is comfortable um, to uh, explain to you, or it might be that something that's more super specialized and there, there is an option to see uh, someone else in New Zealand. So I think it depends on the disease situation that you're talking about. Um, this question of intravenous or subcutaneous versus tablet form. So it is possible to have self-funded oral therapies prescribed out of the public system because you're sort of not taking up um, sort of chair space for infusions and things, but it is, it's not a hundred percent. And I think all you need to, really, you should just be asking your local team um, because definitely intravenous subcutaneous treatments, the Ministry of Health will not let us administer those unfunded treatments in a public system. I don't think pharmaceutical companies want to interact with patients. They prefer to have that um, run through the doctors and we've been more than happy to sort of have those conversations on your behalf, but I'm unaware of anyone successfully negotiating costs. They sort of have their set prices. Um, your haematologist will know a lot of the drugs available to you at the time of appointment, not necessarily all of them. And that's what I said in one, my previous one, they should be receptive to your own research and, and, and uh, investigation about these things. Um, and, but it is, a, again, it, we are sort of um, relying on what we treat in the public system, uh, but a lot of, you know, the, the haematologists are, are well educated, attend regular conferences, uh, virtually nowadays, uh, read medical journals, speak to their colleagues. So the haematology community will, will know pretty much all the, all the therapies available, both in the funded or non-funded system. The clinical trial thing, as I mentioned, is difficult because we think cross-referral is important to, for patients to get access to novel therapies, but given the sort of, sort of uh, boundaries around district health boards, this concept of what we call inter-district flows um, and the way the money swaps, it does need to have some managerial approval, even if us simple docs thinks it's a good idea. Uh, I don't know how much all the different drugs cost, but that's, an, that's why we quote, quote, come for initial consultation and get the proper cost, quote costs. Uh, importing drugs from overseas. Um, this is a very challenging area and it dates back some years with lenalidomide before it was funded. Um, and so I think the take home message here is that some doctors, it's because what happens if you import a drug from overseas, you need to have a prescription at the, at the border um, so that the, if someone says well, who's prescribing this, it needs to have a, a physician who's overseeing that. I think the take home comment is that some doctors are more than happy to provide the prescription, whereas other doctors are uncomfortable doing that because they can't guarantee or, or validate what is in, in that drug. And if, if it, um, you had an adverse reaction, there was, a, there was a, a compound, a component to that drug that was toxic and you had liver failure or kidney failure, 
then I don't think that physician would would forgive themselves that they caused harm. So there are some there are a variety of views uh, in the hematologist community about whether or not they'll provide a patient for a prescription when they're import, self importing. Uh, drugs from overseas, particularly generics, uh, and you can't guarantee the manufacturing qualities of them. The last question just sort of talks about if I did, I think it's sort of asking if I did pay for something or insurance company or whatever, uh, non-funded therapies, would that limit options in the public system? Most most of our drugs in the cancer world, we have to fill in what's called a special authority form that ticks that you're eligible you've got CLL and you've relapsed within three years, so you're eligible for venetoclax and rituximab. But usually there's a rider on that to say that you haven't previously had funded treatments. So most of the time, and it's important to ask that if you're going to seek uh, non-funded treatments or uh, in a private clinic, you know, what, what does this mean? Does this mean that I, in the future, I'll still be able to get that drug if I meet the funded criteria in the public system? So. Um, but there are special authority criteria from Pharmac do usually put in a comment about previous exposure to funded treatments to, to cover that. So um, why don't I open this Q&A if I can do that. Can you see those there, Richard? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Okay, if your doctor makes an application to Pharmac for the NIPA exceptional circumstances, how long does it take to get a decision? Um, so the process, it's not too bad. It has, it was a lot slower, I must say, but lately it's been quicker. And I think that's just been on advocacy. It sort of um, comes into a few things. So um, sometimes there's an example of where this situation has been applied for and granted. So it's an easy tick box. There's a precedent right through to the other side where there is, it's been a blanket no. So it is, hasn't changed, it's still a no. And then there's the stuff in the middle where um, it's um, potentially needs more expert review. So there's sort of different levels of review that go out. And some of our hematology colleagues around New Zealand um, work with Pharmac to provide that expert review. So it's not days, but it's not months. It's, it's a few weeks. Um, so if I access your practice, does, does that mean I can access the unfunded drugs more easily, e.g. ibrutinib for CLL? I'm not sure what you mean by easily, because they still need to be paid for. So if I use ibrutinib, for example, that's an oral therapy. And then because it's an oral therapy, if you wanted to pay for it, then your hematologist at the district health board could um, prescribe that medication. You wouldn't need to go to a private clinic. Ibrutinib for CLL is one of these copays. So at the moment, the drug company will pay half one month and you pay the other. So basically it's half price, but it's still about a hundred grand a year at half price. Um, no, not as much as that. I'll get off the side with the drug company. Um, but it's, it's, it's tens of thousands of dollars. If you have an insurance policy where you feel that and that insurance company might pay for it, then they'll ask you to go to a private clinic because that's how they want the, the, the process to work. Um, but you can pay for oral therapies in most situations from... And without throwing my hematology colleagues around New Zealand under the bus, the other thing there is that the, the, the doctor, the public doctor, has to agree that they're going to prescribe and supervise that drug. They're under no obligation to, to do that. Okay. Um, I agree with the comment that New Zealand is so far behind and it sucks. Um, it is what it is. I know that sounds like a cop-out answer. Um, we only can play what's in front of us. Um, are there any guideposts or best way forward when trying to negotiate with pharma companies directly or for an unfunded therapy? As I said, I'm unaware of any individual negotiating with a pharma company with a pharma company to get a get a um, you know a, a cheaper price or a drug for free. 
Um, usually that comes from the clinician advocating on the patient's behalf uh, or if there might be already an established program. Um, as a rural patient living hours, hours outside of major treatment centre private clinic for a clinical consult can they be done on video link? Yeah, I think this is one of the excellent things that has come out of uh, COVID um, uh, that we realise that we can do a lot of consultations virtually um, and that patients don't need to be seen all the time. So um, certainly a lot of centres now, both public and private, are using either telehealth consultations, Zoom links um, for that. And um, I know at Canopy, they, they facilitate Zoom links for consultations. Um, in, the, in the private clinic setting, import cheaper ibrutinable venetoclax from India and be supported to use it. Yeah, I think I, that's a, what I raised before, is that really it depends on an individual physician because of the issues potentially around what are we buying? Is it truly going to be effective? And what are the what are the side effects that are they're going to be going to be raised? Um, and hi, Angela. Awesome to hear from you. I'm glad you're doing so well. I remember you fondly. Okay. Yes, and thank thank you, Richard. That was an amazing amount of information that's in there. We do still have a few minutes up our sleeve. If some people want to pop through a few more questions. Uh, we might be able to get uh, through a couple more before we have our afternoon tea break. Uh, but I just wanted to, to kind of flag what I thought was the most important part in there, that there's a lot of variables when it comes to making a selection around your treatments, options and your pathway and what's best for you. And it seems like what I was hearing, Richard, is that this really has to be a, a discussion often driven by the patient, but it is their right to do so with their clinician to start to get down to the nitty gritty of explaining what they want to get from their therapy and then starting to use the expertise of the clinician to guide them through what all of their options are. Yeah, I think that's a great summary because you know, I'm not trying to um, hide behind the reality of things, but if you're in a busy public consult environment, people coming at you, it's busy, it's, and, and then the patient's wanting to have further discussions about treatments that are not being proposed, it's not the standard of care, it's what else is out there. I can understand that at times the patient might and their family might get perceptions that they're being brushed off or there's, you know, there's, there's furrowed, furrowed brows on the, on the face and things. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that, 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 that sort of um, busyness and tension you know, why, why do I have to talk about this? I'm talking about what the treatment here is. If you're not happy with that, well, you know, but I think as, as reflecting on that HDC code of rights and then, you know, in the end, what, what the team is, is trying to provide, there needs to be an avenue that a patient feels comfortable that they can advocate for themselves by asking these sort of questions. Perfect. Well, nothing else has come through on those q and A's, so I think we'll officially start to move to close this for the afternoon tea break. So thank you again, Dr. Richard Dursley, for making yourself available.